Good morning. My name is John Hauser, and uh, we're here today to talk with Port Huron School, School Board uh, candidate Jeff Stout. Right. And uh, Jeff, welcome. And uh, we wanted to have a conversation with you today about uh, the Port Huron School Board. But before we get into all that, why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Okay. Been in the area since uh, 1974. Married to uh, my wife now for 43 years. She happens to be a retired Port Huron Area School District Elementary School teacher. A couple of uh, grown daughters from the area went to Port Huron schools, and I currently have two uh, grandsons in uh, the school system, one in Fort Gratiot and one in Port Huron Northern. Um, went to work for the Port Huron Fire Department, did about 27 years there, retired around 15 years ago from there. Currently work for the Port Huron Housing Commission. I do HUD Section 8 housing inspections, and I've uh, been on the board since May of 2000 and looking to continue that job. Well, that was going to be my next question is how long you've been on the board. Uh, how long are your terms? They, when, when I got elected originally, they were four-year terms, and then the law changed a few years back, and, you, and the board made the decision to go to six-year terms. So the current openings are six-year terms. How many board members are there? There are seven board members, and the terms are staggered. I think there's two, two, and three, so they go through a cycle like that. Uh, there are currently two spots that are up for re-election, open, and that that's how that works now. Now, you were at one time the president of the board, were you not? I was. Uh, about midway through there, I did about a nine-year stint as the president, and uh, we... I've worked with five superintendents, uh, four union presidents, dozens of teachers, administrators, board members over those years, too, and that kind of thing. How does a person become the president of the board? It's elected position uh, at their organizational meeting. Every year we elect officers. We have a board president, a board vice president, a secretary, and a treasurer, and that's an internal election at a public meeting of the seven members of the board at that time. Now, how often do you meet? We're, we, we meet at regular board meetings once a month. Traditionally, it's the third Monday of the month, but depending on other schedules, midwinter break, um, Easter break, and those type of things, we sometimes shift it around. So it's, it's once a month. I would assume that these are uh, open to the public. They are. Do you get many folks to attend the meetings? We, um, we, we usually get quite a few people who attend. A lot of those are staff members, too, who have presentations to make, or we do a lot of honoring of staff, students, and other groups, and we get family members to come in for that type of thing. Uh, and then, of course, if someone has a particular issue that they want to come and bring to the school board, then they, they show up and, and they can speak too. Now, is this, is there a, are these meetings televised? They are. Are they live televisions, or do you have to watch a specific channel? Uh, they're, they're through our um, EBW TV right now. And I believe, I believe we record them and then we show them again. You go to the, the district's website and you can click through to tell you find the link to the TV channel. And then you, you have some options there. You can watch the whole meeting start to finish or if you were um, only cared about a certain segment of the meeting, a certain issue that involved you, then you could select that out and only watch. So if the meeting goes an hour, hour and a half, two hours, but there's a 20 minute segment on the topic you're interested in, you can watch that too. Now is the, uh, as a board member, is this a paid position? No, it's, a, it's all volunteer, no pay, no money. So what would compel a person that, uh, such as yourself, <laughs> decide that you want to jump into this arena? Well, uh, I, I think as, as, as a parent in a community, I think you have a vested interest in, in the education of your children. So my kids were in school when I became interested and the opportunity came up. I was already working for the fire department in a somewhat public service job. So it was kind of a natural fit. And I, and I always took an interest in, in what was going on locally. And that, so, so that's why I jumped in and then um, got involved and, and, and that's where we are. Now, this is probably a, a real basic question, but I'm sure there's our listeners that have no idea what members of the board are responsible for or what they do. <laughs> One of the things you find out real quick is that a lot of people have no, no understanding what the Board of Education does. And the board is essentially seven individuals elected to position to work as a team, and they're in charge of the governance 
and the accountability assessment of the district and the superintendent, and they're also in charge of policy making decisions. What we don't do, and, and this is where the problem comes in occasionally, the misunderstanding is we don't micromanage the day-to-day -day operations. We, we set the policy, we set the guidelines, we set the goals, the mission, the vision with, with the superintendent, and then we kind of get out of the way. And then we monitor and assess and modify as, as we go. But if, if your intent is to get on the school board because you're going to you want the football coach fired, or you don't like the way the buses run, you want a different bus route, or that type of thing. That's, that's not what we do. We don't, we don't get into the micromanagement of the day-to-day -day operation. Uh, now, did you say you established the budget, or the superintendent, the, and you the, approve it? We, the budget is done internally through our, our, our executive team. And the board, the budget comes to the board prepared on, under function item only. We don't go the department line by line by line. We do that. So we every year and then three times a year we update and amend the budget as we go through because um, we make educated guesses on a lot of things and stuff. So if we plan to spend this amount of money for snow plowing but we either had a heavy snow and more plowing or we had less snow and less plowing and stuff then we have periods where we can we amend and change our, our distribution of money as what we is go the through. Budget? It's around eighty-six million dollars a year. Now, how does that compare to most school districts in the state? Um, it's oh. probably fairly comparable to districts our size. I can tell you, since I've been on the board, the budget has gone down because the budget in Michigan is based on enrollment, and and you so you you get a foundation allowance through a proposal a formula that comes from the state. And when I got on the, since I've been on the board, I think our highest board revenue year was like 104, 105 million dollars. But our enrollment has dropped down too. So um, as your enrollment goes down, your revenue goes down, and you need to adjust your expenditures. So, well, the obvious question is, why does enrollment go down? A couple of reasons. Most recently, probably in the last 10 years. Number one is the birth rate. And that it's not only a, a Port Huron trend, but it's a Michigan trend, but it's also a nationwide trend too. There are less people having less children in all areas across the state. The other thing is we took a really hard economic hit back in 07, 08, 09 right there. So a lot of it is migration of families to other states. If you work in Michigan and your company goes out of business and the company says, we're going to eliminate your position, but we have a job in North Carolina or we have a job in Iowa that you can transfer to, and your choice is to be unemployed or go to stay working and continue your seniority and your benefits with the company, you're likely to pick up and move. So if mom's a nurse or dad's an engineer or whatever and the company moves, they have two kids, kids go with them. Mm -hmm. So you lose the foundation allowance for those two kids. Too. And then, so we're starting to see a slow increase in Michigan of those jobs coming back, but we, we don't, we're not going to see the same amount of people and the same amount of kids as we had before. How, what impact does School of Choice have for Port Huron City Schools? Uh, school of Choice affects us. Some uh, parents ha now have more options, uh, the uh, legislature, and we like to believe that um, we're as competitive, if not more competitive in most of the areas that people are seeking. Parents choose to send their kids where they do for a variety of reasons. It's for the academic, it's for the sports, it's for the band program, it's for the religious connection, it's whatever. So we, what our goal is to pro provide as many opportunities for kids to be successful that their, their parents will, will stick with us. Are you, um, how, is, how, how are you funded? Uh, and is it the best way to go because you always hear problems about school districts are in it's trouble. School districts were way back before um, Proposal A, school districts were, they were allowed to have a, a local millage. And in the Port Huron area, if you grew up here, you're familiar with millage yeah. requests over and over and over and over. You got that. In fact, we all, we had, a, you know, we had to go to half days 20 some years ago because uh, we didn't have enough money to run the schools full time and that. So the legislature at the time through compromise, developed Proposal A, which shifted the funding, the prim primary funding, away from local millages to 
state funding. So you get so much, a minimum amount, so much per student enrolled from the state. And then that's backed up with federal and state grants and also a portion of sales tax that comes in too. The problem with that now is that it, it, it doesn't accurately reflect the need to educate kids now. The, um, it, it, a lot of districts at the time, there was, like I said, there was a minimum. But other districts had a higher minimum because they had already ha had higher amount of money. They'd also, they're also allowed to, if they want an additional millage, they can seek that in their own district and that. So we've got some districts, you know, around 73, 7,400 hours per student. We've had other districts in the state, they get 13, 12, 13,000 hours per student a year mm -hmm. and at, at a with a different makeup for their money too. So. Um, uh, that's where it stands now. There's been a lot of conversation in the last five, six, ten years about, well, proposal A is good, but it's not working, but no one's come up with a solution mm -hmm. to make it better. Now, you've been on the school board a while, mm -hmm. so you have seen the ups and the downs. If you had to say four major challenges that you see today going forward mm -hmm. for the Port Huron School District, what is that? Well, number one, for me personally, in my, in my my path every year is that, that I, we start with one goal to begin with, and that is expenditures can't exceed revenue. Mm -hmm. Probably in our district, it's pretty routine across the state too, over 75% of the people who live in our school district don't have kids in school. One of their primary concerns is that if I give you a dollar, I want you to spend a dollar as efficiently as you can. I'd rather have you spend 96 cents and keep a little bit in case you need something. But they, so financial responsibility and fiscal responsibility is important. Well, that drives everything else. Then that drives facilities and services and that type of thing. So when you get into the programs and that, I think it's important right now, we've got two or three priorities. Um, number one is to increase our literacy rate and our student achievement rate. We, um, the state of Michigan is going to a um, third grade reading law coming up in the 2019-20 year that's going to put some additional responsibility on districts and parents and the community as far as success for kids. So I, I think we probably all understand and believe that the earlier and the better you read, the more the greater your chance for success as you go forward mm -hmm. in life than that. Um, Two number th facilities upgrade. We've been working on some bond projects and since I've been on the board. Um, we built a couple performing arts centers and we had a 23 or 24 million dollar bond that did some very basics in our schools and that our most recent one of 106 million, we've done some really great things as far as bringing our facilities up. We have um, <laughs> our high schools, for example. We are improving both of our high schools. There were literally desks at our high schools that some of these kids' grandparents sat at. They'd been around 30 and 40 years and that kind of thing. So we're bringing, we're bringing the facilities into, into the new era. We're also bringing the technology, which is part of it, um, and that. And in all of those, our primary, primary concern has always been safety and security. We're all aware of the risk that the schools face out there and we and we've done quite a bit to secure facilities provide secure atrium entrances and buzz call buzz to get in and those types of things so now uh, you just had an open house for a new building that you put together that's uh, near the administration building yes can there. you tell us about that what what is the well that's our early childhood center and that's um, it actually brought along it, it it's it's for three and four year olds uh, so that we can offer them a personalized education so that they can start to build their educational process before they come to us. A lot of times we've had um, kids who enter kindergarten in the early parts of school who, who come from a background that has them initially behind. So this is an opportunity to reach out to those kids at a little longer, younger age, provide that foundation for them so that when they hit our school system at the kindergarten level, they can hit the ground running at that. We also do a bunch of other things. We have, um, at that building, we have the deaf and hard of hearing programs. We have early childhood special education. We also have infant and toddler education programs in that. Um, we got a great start readiness reading program. What we've done, and, and I think the consensus across the educational field right now is that early childhood is critically important in that. So what we've done is we've consolidated all of those 
professional instructors, the interventionists, the people who, the therapists, and all those people who work in those fields, we've consolidated in one spot with all of the resources in that so that they can work as a team to bring these kids uh, uh, up to standard before they enter the system. Now, do these people, d does, the, uh, does the school district provide the transportation or do the parents drop the children off? I, I, it's a combination of both. And, and that I, I, I'm no, I don't know the exact specifics because the program's only been up and running now probably three, four weeks and that kind of thing. So I, don't, I, I didn't dig into the deep details of how we get, but I know we do run some buses into there and we'll, there's a parent drop-off area in the front too. You, you talked, uh, I know a, a major concern. Now my children are adults now as well. And if I had a student that uh, would be going to school, I would be concerned about security in the building. Mm -hmm. Do you have um, armed guards or retired police officers? or? We currently have two resource officers from the Port Huron Police Department, one at, one at our, our, each high school, and one at Northern High School and one at uh, Port Huron High School, too. And they make some outreach efforts to our middle school and elementary schools, too, and that. But, um, again, we that type of service is a cooperative agreement between the district and local law enforcement and unfortunately a lot of times it's, it's based on funding too mm -hmm. and that it was initially started the city of port here and picked up the ball in the first year and i know they've just uh received some additional grant money to continue for a while and that type of thing in addition to being just security all but they're also a good liaison officer with the community. They're there to talk to kids and answer questions and help them get through um, other problems in life rather it, than just security. Is D.A.R.E. still a viable program in the community? Um, it comes and goes and we have our community, we have city schools and we have township schools so the, the degree of involvement is great in some spots but not so much in others. How involved does the school board get uh, with discipline issues? Discipline issues are, um, they, they start in the building and they're handled internally through the, the administrative staff of the building and the principal and then um, there's, there's a process that they work their way through from the building up to the administrative office and that. And they don't normally come to the Board of Education unless they involved a uh, a short term or a lengthy suspension or expulsion. Well, you've been on the school board a long time and mm -hmm. you've got adult children, so you've had kids in school forever. Uh, <laughs> have you seen a decline in discipline in the schools? I, I, would, I would think I, what I've. I don't think there's any increase in like assaults and those type of things. Discipline, is, it's a funny word because discipline means that the kid in the back of the room is making a bunch of noise and the teacher can't teach. So mm -hmm. there are different varying degrees of that. I know the state of Michigan has um, reworked a lot of the language and the laws that have to, how you deal with discipline problems. And that, so it's it's a tough call. It's a it's a it's a local call. But the the teachers and the administrators have been trained uh, according to the law and and the appropriate responses for those. There are our our major goal in the discipline process is to keep that child in school, because if if you kick them out, then they're going to fall behind, and then they, then it's hard to get them back in the system, and then that contributes to the other social problems that develop from not being in school. So we, we always want to keep kids in school as much as possible, and, and, but we want them also to understand that there's a responsibility for being here. Uh, what role, do you think the role of the parent has changed much in the last 20 years? Do you think it's different? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It, it's much different, and, and I, I don't know, um, the direct cause of that, I mean, there's a lot of theories. We have we we have smaller families, but we also have single parent families. We have shared parent families, um, one or two children, and they spend Monday through Wednesday with mom, and then they spend Thursday through Sunday with dad. Or then we have others where grandparents are raising children, and we we also have a, a most people would probably be surprised to learn we have a significant homeless population that goes to Port Huron schools too. And that so as far as but I, I think as as a reasonable adult I would I would 
guess that most people feel that, that the way it used to be isn't the way it is now. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned consolidation. I don't know if it's in the terms that I'm going to ask you, but uh, has there been any consider? I know you have consolidated some schools, and those have got to be incredibly tough decisions. Has there been any conversation because of the, the drop in enrollment and the cost of running a building and things of that nature of maybe going to one high school? That, that comes up occasionally. I don't think there's been a lot of serious discussion because what I remember in the past, most of the negatives outweigh the positives of doing that. And that it, there, are a, there are a lot of variables involved in that. Um, we have a lot of alumni from those schools. I'm, not, I'm, I'm sure if you were going to have a public discussion about maybe closing two schools, high schools, and making one, that you'd need a very large auditorium to, to have that discussion because there are a lot of emotional feelings about that. There, there's a continual discussion about efficiency and maximizing our services, providing the best opportunities at the most reasonable cost. And like I said before, Port Huron, uh, Boy, they probably at one point had more than double the elementary schools we have now. Almost every neighborhood had a neighborhood elementary mm -hmm. school. And you can drive around town and see those buildings, the Tyler Building, the Monroe Building. There was Lincoln Elementary School. There were, there were tons of them that no longer is. But we're talking about a time when enrollment was over 15,000, and, and now we're just slightly over 8,000. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're half the size we were 30 years ago. And again, I said 75% of the people in the community don't have kids in school. And, and they probably wouldn't be happy that you're paying maintenance and on ten empty buildings. Do you, uh, you know, teachers make the thing run? Um, uh, a teacher, I think, really can make a difference to a child. Oh, absolutely. Uh, what is the uh, uh, the age grouping of your teachers? It, it, do you see in the near future more and more of them retiring, and how do you replace them? And well, it, you know, it, it's really hard to to gauge how that um, retirement's an individual decision, so um, it, it, it's hard to predict. But, but what I would say is, from my experience, especially in my experience in the fire department, it seems that employers over the past 20, 30 years, or whatever, hired groups of employees in blocks that were similar in age, and as they move through their career, the people who were forty soon become 50 and then they're 55 and then they're 60. So there are ups and downs, but I don't think there's any predictability that say, okay, every year we're going to have seven people leave or we're going to have 12 people leave and that kind of thing. So in addition, the part of the, that goes with that is then filling that position. And there are less qualified candidates going into the teaching field. So it, it, it's, it makes it tougher to, find, to fill. And that kind of thing. How big an issue is it to find uh, substitute teachers? It's tough right now. It's, it's, it's tough. We're always reaching out to, to have subs. Uh, I know the state of Michigan has changed some of the standards for subbing. Um, I don't always agree with their decision. I um, teaching is a very special job. It takes a. a it's almost <laughs> it's almost like you're born with that that passion. I think it's hard to learn, and uh, we get we've got wonderful teachers who spend probably more, double the time that they get paid for, just making sure that every kid in their, in their classroom is successful. So it, it's a tough job, um, and, that, and, we're, and we're very proud of the people we have that continue to do it every day. Uh, before we started chatting, we had mentioned off air about uh, what's going on in New Mexico. And apparently they have started this four-day work week. Mm -hmm. And it has been very popular. Uh, apparently students are, their attendance is up. Uh, teachers are happier because now they get a weekend, the pressure's not on, uh, they add like, I don't know, 45 minutes to an hour each mm -hmm. day, so they get Friday off. The downside, of, of course, is uh, daycare and all that kind right. of stuff. Is this, is this, and I, apparently it saves them between sixty and $100,000 a, a year so mm -hmm. far. Uh, is this something uh, that might be out of the box that uh, the school board will look into? At this point, it hasn't come up locally. Um, it's certainly, a t it can be a topic for conversation, um, but I think it's, it, it's, a, it's a broad topic that has a lot of, uh, of variables. So 
it, it as, as I found with my experience on the on the school board, almost there's there's almost six sides to every story, and you'll find four people in favor and two people against. And and I, uh, sometimes if you're the if you scream the loudest, you think you have the most important voice and that kind of thing. But at, at this point. What I know about it is there's been some research, but it's kind of it's it's kind of hard to predict the successful outcome of a program that's still kind of in its infancy and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. There, I know there are um, a few places, a few districts, a few states that have are looking at that. I also know I'm aware that there are some that went that tried it and didn't like it, went back. Mm -hmm. They they tried the four day week and they went to the back to the five day that type of thing but again i think the major obstacle and this was a conversation yesterday when i was watching uh, the news was was child care mm -hmm. um how many teachers are on the payroll for Port Huron school District? it varies i don't i don't have an exact count i think we're close close to 500 but it could be slightly more slightly less is tenure still part of the Ten years part of the equation, but the, the the legislature modified a lot of the the guidelines for tenure. Mm -hmm. and, and um, this was an interesting. My my sister retired recently. She had thirty eight years. Mm -hmm. My mother had forty years, and her first teaching assignment was grades one through eight of Amish kids mm -hmm. in a one room schoolhouse in Ohio. And uh, one of the things, and, and this is true of from my generation, uh, was civics is that uh, you knew a little bit about the Constitution, you knew a little bit about uh, state capitals, you knew about the legislature, things of that nature. And uh, I was reading an article about the, uh, the citizenship civics test that is given to people that want to become citizens right. of the United States. You have to get six out of ten right. And uh, my question is, if you were to give this, this test, and I think there's a, hundred, there's a possibility of a hundred questions, do you feel pretty confident that the kids in, in Port Huron uh, would do pretty well on that? I think they could pass the test, but I, I understand where you're going with the question and stuff. And, and I think the curriculum that we used to provide isn't the same as it is now. And the relevance of some of those topics have been put aside for other for, for whatever reason. Right now, there's a heavy emphasis on reading and comprehension, literacy, math, science, and those types of things. And I think over time, for the for the good or bad, because you could probably get both opinions, is that we've shifted away from some topics that we probably should spend more time on. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the most recent political upheaval across the nation in the last six, eight, ten years indicates too that a lot of people just beginning and just getting into this process, really never got a foundational mm -hmm. basis for their position. They don't understand the Constitution. They don't understand the legislative process, the three branches of government, the checks and balances, that type of things too. The problem then becomes trying to squeeze every topic that someone thinks is important or more important into the day in that because there's always somebody that thinks this is important and we could do away with that, or so. So we've lost. We're we're trying to balance, mm -hmm. and we're constantly amending and shifting that. But with the intervention of the state, I was going to say the help of the state, but sometimes when the state helps, it's <laughs> <laughs> it's not a big help. How important do you think uh, athletics are in a school district? Personally, I, I like athletics as part of the process. I don't, I don't look at athletics as a stepping stone to the NBA, the Major League Baseball, or the NFL. I look at it as a, a good social opportunity for our kids to become familiar with their peers, to learn how to adapt and adjust as a group, as a team, and understand the concepts of discipline and accountability. And I think winning is important, but I said, it, I, I said before, occasionally losing is a greater life lesson, that type mm -hmm. of thing. I think they're a very important part of the school day picture, but I don't think they're any more significant than the academic or the musical or the band or the arts and that type of things. There has to be a balance. And what we try to do is offer the maximum amount of opportunities for kids to be successful. We want to find out one or two things we hope that the, that the kid who's drifting away can focus on, and then that translates into a more successful ap academic. 
I heard, I heard a, a local politician make the comment that uh, the whole state is looking at consolidating schools. Yeah. And I, apparently there has been a lot of consolidation. And one of the big issues of, among schools is, okay, if we consolidate, what's going to be the name of the sports team? Oh, yeah. And apparently that is huge. I knew in Ohio that would be huge. Huge. But sports in Michigan is, is out you know, yeah. is, is out there as well. And, and I would guess the only state worse than us is Texas. Where <laughs> it, it, sports is king there. It, it, it's kind of crazy. So yeah, there are always again when you're when you're sitting as a board working with your superintendent and the administrative team, and you're looking at the future because we're not looking at next week. We're looking at six months, nine months, a year, three years, five years out. Where are we going? What direction are we taking? That these issues have all of these variables, and for every great idea, there's. Two people that don't like it because it affects childcare, it affects my work schedule, it affects um, sports, it affects band. And, and like you said, um, I've been a Port Huron Northern Husky my whole life, and now you want me to be something different. I don't want to be. Or I've been a big red at Port Huron High, and, and so I don't really care about mm -hmm. anything else. I just want to keep being. You know, I want to be a husky, a husky, or a big red, or or or, or those types of things, or you know, a Spartan or a Wolverine, and and those types of things. Yeah, those. <laughs> that's reality. That's yeah. uh, That's how people view it. None of the issues are ever quite as simple as a three paragraph column in the newspaper. Well, of course, you always have to deal with, and I can appreciate the position you're in on the school board. Is you you come up with a great idea and you want to implement it, but it might have unintended consequences, right. and. Uh, I guess the, the smart guy that uh, that's on the board, we got to consider those those pieces. And and you should, as a, as a conscientious board member, what my, my focus is on students. How does this affect the students? And, and I, I had told a group of people not too long ago. I said, you know, occasionally, when you devote your efforts and your time to making kids happy, you're occasionally going to make some adults unhappy. But you have to go back to the principle that got you there. That this is why we're this is why we're open. This is what we do. We have an obligation to provide the maximum educational process for the most amount of opportunities when they leave our care and that kind of thing. And sometimes adults are going to be uncomfortable with some of those decisions. Now, is the school board job on the uh, on the ballot on on election day? Yes, November sixth. There are there are two spots open, uh, two incumbents running, myself and Rhonda Ryan, and then there are two challengers for that spot. So there are four people running for two spots for okay. six year terms. Well, unless you have anything else, um, we really thank you for your time. And there's a lot more involved in this than I think people realize. I, I appreciate the opportunity to come in. Uh, I would, what I would like to say, I guess, is I would encourage what I would like to see and what we're really seeking is more community activity in our schools. I, I, it, it's easy to sit on the couch at the end of the day after you've had a hard day or you worked outside or whatever to, to just assume that tomorrow the schools are going to be open and this is how they've always run. But I would encourage you when you have an opportunity and the school has an event, please take the time to show up. You're, you're certainly welcome and we want to have you go through and ask all your questions and find out what school looks like today because everybody has an image of what it was when they went to school. But high school is not the same one today as it was when I went, and even when my kids went to school, it's different now. So I would, I would encourage more of our community to, become, to come out and be actively involved in the process, and uh, I think that's where we get the best decisions. Well, again, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jeff Stout, who's running for the mm -hmm. Port Huron School District, uh, the board. And uh, again, we just met another candidate. And we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for having me.